One, two, three, go. Yeah. My topic is poetry and the city, and specifically the city as the container of multitudes. That phrase, as many of you know, is Walt Whitman's famous remark and song of myself. Do I contradict myself? Very well, then I contradict myself. I am large. I contain multitudes. The same might be said of any city. Contradiction and multitude is one way of describing the urban energies toward which human beings century after century have been drawn until at this, at this moment, our species has essentially become an urban species. Um, Whitman's visionary expansively democratic work praises New York, I have to say in particular, rich, hemmed thicker all around with sail ships and steamships, numberless crowded streets, high growths of iron, slender, strong, light, splendidly uprising toward clear skies, immigrants arriving, 15 or 20,000 in a week, the carts hauling goods, the manly race of drivers of horses, the brown-faced sailors, the mechanics of the city, well-formed, beautiful face, looking you straight in the eyes, and so on. You can feel Whitman's joy in his urban multitudes. He thinks the immigrants are wonderful. And you notice the egalitarianism of his vision. In a Whitman catalog, no person or phenomenon is superior to any other. There's a sense of the collective, countless disparate individuals contributing to a spectacular dynamic reality. So I would claim that whatever is specifically American about American poetry, whatever distinguishes our poetry from English poetry, we owe to Whitman. Notice also those long lines, those rolling, uncontained improvisational rhythms, the importance of their unpredictability. One of the great things American culture contributes to world culture is the deep unspoken conviction that our future is not rigidly determined by our past, that we aren't, for example, imprisoned by a class system. Well, you know, we're sort of semi-imprisoned. But we're amnesiac a lot of the time about the past and we think we can change in the future. Whitman's form, his music embodies that conviction that we're not imprisoned by the past. Okay, my husband and I both grew up in New York City. After 50 years in Princeton, New Jersey, we returned to our roots here. For me, this return was a wish come true, and I immediately began writing poems arising from my new neighborhood on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. I'll read a few of those to you in a moment, but I also realized almost immediately that throughout most of human history, there was no poetry of the city. How curious. Poets living urban lives were writing about imaginary shepherds and shepherdesses. Poets wrote love poetry, death poetry, war poetry, court poetry, religious poetry, nature poetry. Well, poetry was supposed to be elevated. Cities were base places of corruption, criminality, dirt, and danger. Working class life, commercial life, was below the notice of the refined, the elite, the educated. And if it was ever depicted in poetry, it was depicted with horror. These stereotypes are still with us. Nature is good, cities are evil. But here's the first poem I wrote while walking around my new neighborhood. And all, all the poems I'm going to share with you today are from this book called Waiting for the Light. August morning, Upper Broadway. 
as the body of the beloved is a window through which we behold the blackness and vastness of space pulsing with stars. And as the man on the corner with his fruit stand is a window, and the cherries, blackberries, raspberries, avocados, and carrots are a rose window, like the one in Chartres, yes, or the one in Paris, through which light floods from the other world, the pure one stabbing tourists with malicious, abundant joy. Although the man is tired in the summer heat and reads his newspaper listlessly without passion and people pass his stand buying nothing, let us call this scene a window looking out, not at a paradise, but as a paradise might be if we had eyes to see the women in their clinging dresses, the season's fruit, the babies in their strollers, infinitely soft, clear window after clear window. So that was my first uh, citizenly uh, city poem, and I liked it. Um, but then I realized there was something missing from it. And I thought, well, what's, what's missing from that vision um, is, is the noise, the sound, the voices, the language. And on Broadway, a, a block from where I'm living, um, what everybody is speaking is Spanish, which was somewhat disconcerting to me at first until I realized that at the turn of the previous century, when my grandparents came here, um, their neighborhood was filled with Yiddish. So it's one tide after another. The light. What is the birthplace of the light that stabs me with joy? And what is the difference between avocados sold on the street by a young man conceived in Delhi and avocados sold in the West Side Market by Corn Row Girls, I am anyhow afloat in tides of Puerto Rican, Cuban, Mexican, West Indian, Spanish, wavelets of Urdu, swelling like oceans, sweating like jackhammers, rasping like crows, calling out in the West Side Market, the right aid, and every other shop on the street, Por qué no comprendes? You don't own this city anymore. The city belongs and has always belonged to its shoals of exiles, crashing ashore in foaming, salty droplets. Como no, gringita? With their dances and their grandmothers, with their drinking and their violence, and their burning yearning to be free and smelling money. What? What is the joy? Is it these lamps of light, those babies in their strollers, those avocados with their dark green pebbled rinds um, shining from inside? Two for four dollars in the West Side Market and three for four dollars from the cart. Joy, like white light between the dollar bills, is it? these volleys of light fired by ancestors who remember tenements, the sweatshops, the war, who supposed their children's children would be rich and free. Thank you. So this, this next one is also um, from my street, our street, the first snowfall. The first snowfall begin to turn, start over. The first snowfall 
begins to turn gray. A homeless guy lies across the freezing sidewalk, hands shaking, while the young cop gently asks if he's sick. He says he is, and the cop asks, does he want to go to the hospital? The guy's whole body has the shakes. Cold night is falling. They are waiting for an ambulance, and the men working at a parking garage down the block lean on a Toyota, watching, respectful. Poor naked wretches, cries Shakespeare's Lear, in the voice of a man insane with grief and indignation. Having grown up in the city, I always thought it was poor homeless wretches. I imagine rags as well as homelessness on Shakespeare's streets as the snow pelted down and began to turn gray like here, but with the filth of horses, no street lights, probably the watchman kicking you in the balls. Nobody believes in the kindness of New Yorkers, but I saw the drunk stretched boldly across the width of sidewalk, the policeman being gentle to him, the ER squad hoisting him into the ambulance, being gentle, the men down the street not laughing, snow turning gray, nobody laughing. So, okay, um, one other poem, one more poem, and then we'll have a Q&A. How's that? Um, the city is also fun, as well as wild and weird. And this poem is called Manahatta, which is the Lenape name for the island, Manahatta. Uh, and also what Whitman calls it. So, I was asking for something specific and perfect for my city, says Walt, lover of crowds, praiser of trades and occupations, celebrant of the daily tide of immigrants, and I too seek the perfect image of you. You mothering harbor, you royal sewer, you finger inside the sky, you dangling dream deferred, you queer hideout, you incubator of Jewish jazz, you who exist as a landing field for helicopters, you whose laughter is heartless, you digest dudes who crave to be big shots, celebrities, hedge fund managers, who like to show off and be bad, who get a kick from champagne. I am looking for a toaster in the hardware store. And here, two women stand behind a counter, minding their cash registers in their red apron uniforms. A points to B and says, you know, she did say she went skinny dipping. I have to wonder where. B lifts a shoulder, smirks, the Harlem River. Really? It's where show-off boys used to dive and we giggling girls used to just watch those bad boys. Times do change. B says, I have to let my bad girl out sometimes. So, there are a few city poems. Um, so, so what we'll do, what we'll do, uh, again, go to the chat and just throw your name in there. And, and we'll just kind of work off that as a cue. <clears throat> it's great to have you here, Alicia. It's because you've joined us on several occasions around the table. It's good to see you in front of the table. Good to be here. So Barbara Mossberg, we'll start with you. You had something. 
you're delighted to be here, but at the same time, I think you may have had a question or a comment. I, I had a request, and Alicia will know my request, but I am so excited on this theme of poetry in the city and the life. Oh, the vividness, the way all of our senses are alive there. Would you read us April? Oh, April. Um, can I find it? Uh, Barbara, I know this is a favorite poem of it yours. Yes, and it will be everybody's favorite. This this is going to be our anthem to where is it? Our, our the gift of consciousness alive on a city street. Well I'll read it if I can find it. As she's looking, I gotta say, as a civilian in this conversation, I'm not a poet. <laughs> I'm just I'm just enjoying this tremendously. <laughs> We're gonna hear about I will. I in the and chat. Dogs. Yeah. Bob, I've posted the poem in the chat. Okay. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> there it is. Go to the chat under Heather and you'll find it. There it is. Okay, so people can read it in the chat while I read it. April. And this is a poem from the book, The Old Woman, The Tulip and the Dog, in which in every poem, the old woman has something to say, then the tulip has something to say, then the dog has something to say. April. By April, um, maybe, we'll, maybe we'll all be cured. <laughs> and we'll have no more anxieties. April. The optimists among us, taking heart because it is spring, skip along, attending their meetings, signing their email petitions, marching with their satiric signs, singing their give peace a chance songs, posting their rainbow Twitters and blogs, believing in a better world, for no good reason, I envy them, said the old woman. The seasons go round, they go round and around, said the tulip, swaying among her friends in their brown bed in the sun, in the April breeze, under a maple canopy that was also swaying, only with greater motions, casting greater shadows and the grass hardly stirring. What a concerto of good stinks, says the dog, trotting along Riverside Drive in the early spring afternoon, sniffing this way and that. How gratifying the violins of the river, the tubas of the traffic, the trombones of the leafing elms with the legato of my rival's piss at their feet, and the leftover meat and grease singing along in all the waste baskets. So that, that is April in the city, definitely. And um, one of the pleasures of walking in the city is all the people with their dogs making friends with one another. Hey, Michael yes. Warner, you're up. <laughs> Might have hear me. Where's Michael? He, he might have stepped away. He might have stepped back for a second. No, this is Michael. Michael Werner here. Uh, wonderful poetry, Alicia. I have a question about your statement about the absence of urban life and early poetry as it applies to Shakespeare. Uh, two counter examples from Shakespeare would be Julius Caesar, where a lot of the early action oh. occurs in the middle of, uh, I guess it's Rome. Oh, sure. And also um, Henry the Fourth, Part One, where the sort of Falstaff and his merry men in the inn are very seem to me to be a very urban environment. So I just wondered whether Shakespeare was an exception or whether he's the exception. That um, no, no, he's he's not an exception. But um, here's where the theory of of literary genres comes in. 
um, drama, especially comedy, but also history, his historical drama, um, was a lower genre than lyric poetry or epic poetry. Lyric poetry didn't have cities in it. Um, dramatic poetry had cities all over the place, especially the com especially the comedies. Um, that's where that's where you put comedy um, in the in the sixteenth century. You you put it in drama. So I yeah, I understand the distinction. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Uh, I've got a question before we jump into it, uh, before we go to Heather, who's, who's next. Um, there is urban poetry, there is more pastoral po poetry, but there is, is there something called suburban poetry for those of us who are long commutes and that type of Ooh. thing? I'm asking this solely as a civilian because I don't know better. Well, it could well be that um, a great deal of American poetry in the 20th century, especially the late 20th century, um, is suburban poetry. How about, um, of course, my mind goes completely blank, but if you, if you look at many anthologies, probably most of what you will see will be um, work by poets who teach in universities, and some of them will be urban and some of them will be suburban, but there's a great deal of suburban poetry and a lot of it is domestic. Uh, so let's see, next was, would be uh, Heather. Did you have a question? It was just a statement or it's up to you? No, I was just, I was just uh, making light. Shakespeare never lived in New York City. I was just... <laughs> And why not? It's just my sense of humor. <laughs> so, so, so next would, would go to, I, and forgive me if I, if I stumble a toy dare coat. Is that, is that correct? You're on, you're on mute. I just uh, thank Alicia for these beautiful poems. And uh, I always want to hear more poems. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Toy. It's great to see you here. Um, if, and, if anybody, uh, else? yeah, and, and, and if we have more questions, I'll yeah, take more questions. Karen, if you uh, don't have Karen, them. you're up. Yeah, I, I did want to ask you if you if you want to say something about how your poems are different from other poets who live in New York, like you know Frank O'Hara or. Uh, um, Hard crane because they all write about the city, but you write about the streets and I was at people uh, and I was wondering about the human element, you know, like about paying attention to people in poetry and what they say, giving voice. Do, do you have any? You know, okay, Hart, Hart Crane writes like a seer, like, like a drunk prophet. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's mystical, he's, he's all over the place, and it's gorgeous. Um, I don't know how to be gorgeous, um, but Hart, Hart Crane is, um, he's a bard. O'Hara, on the, on the other half, is not a bard at all. He's conversational, he's chatty, um, he's, he's strolling around and here's what he's looking at now and here's what he's looking at now. Um, and I think m maybe, well, I have, I have a poem addressing him in Waiting for the Light um, and I could read that later. But maybe a difference is, I think, there is always a political edge to my poems. Um, and and part, of, part of that certainly is, is wanting, wanting to get across 
the sense that the city is vile and ugly and violent and corrupt and wonderful, and that its wonderfulness is partly because um, so many ethnicities are here. Because we're, we're such a tableau of differences. Um, and I don't, I don't know that there's anybody else writing about the city that, that, that wants to commend our multitudinousness, not only in numbers, but also in where, where people come from and what they bring. Um, and of course, some of the time it's just straight politics. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I'm going to ask some of the other folks on the call here because, again, mm -hmm. there, there are tremendous poets among us, and not me, obviously, but among the call, for their thoughts. And I'll, I'll put Andre on the spot. I mean, you lived in New York, you lived in yeah. uh, Louisiana, and of course, uh, Bucharest. I think Bucharest. No, no, no. I was Romania before that. But walk yeah. us through your your take on that. Well, I I love uh, Alicia's poems, and I love New York. I moved back to New York after 50 years, so I'm in Brooklyn now. Same. And I was wondering, too, you know, that how they're wonderful poems that couldn't have been written now because uh, there are so many people in your poems, and they, they were people who were <laughs> together, and they were in groups, and they were sweating, and they weren't wearing masks, and now everybody's in isolation. This is not New York, the New York of your poems. I read your poems. I think it's a wonderful book, by the way, uh, with nostalgia, because this is not the New York that we love. Um, and, you know, really the title to the volcano and after it, and I thought, well, you know, this is not under the volcano like <laughs> Malcolm Lowry, but it's, uh, you know, it is after, it is after. And this particular after is, it feels very sad and empty of people. So I'm wondering what you are doing now without all those people. Well, <laughs> thanks for asking. But in, in fact, although many poets I know have, have, have been motivated to write poetry, uh, angry or sad or hopeful or whatever, during this time of a trifecta of crises that we've got. It's not, it's not only the virus um, locking us up in our homes, but it's also, it's also um, the campaign and the post campaign. And it's also Black Lives Matter. And um, I've been, I've been paralyzed and not writing any poetry at all. I don't know if that's true of anyone, anyone else here who is, who is a poet. Not um, only a poet, but a can't... poet, but also prose. I mean, Joyce, are, are you seeing that in, in your writing as well, where, you're, where the, um, the pandemic has, has slowed your output because you're known to be, you don't have to have a, a strong writing work ethic. Well, it's a complicated question because the different kinds of writing, as Alicia knows, is writing that's much more personal and like memoristic. I think one can always write that. But there's another kind of writing that's more formal and maybe aiming toward a different kind of audience even. So it's a matter of concentration, I think, and sort of reaching for something that you can do. There isn't really such a thing as writer's block. There's just, there are, there are gradations of things that we're strong enough to do. So I, I'm sure I feel exactly like Alicia and perhaps Jerry, her husband, in being very frustrated and my concentration broken and just in the grip of a kind of paradox about our political situation it isn't just Trump, you know, or maybe that's not even the, the issue. It's that we've been set against one another. So almost half of America 
now is antagonistic toward the other half. So Alicia, who's in the tradition of Whitman, and I would put myself, I hope, in that tradition too, we're sort of confronted by the paradox that some of the people we want to write about and honor and have all this written about, you know, working class people, <laughs> they no longer are just an audience for us, you know, to, to um, relate to. They, they drifted away from us or they repudiated us. So it's a moment in time when writers feel a kind of anxiety of identity. Well, I think there's there's a lot to say for that, but also it's it's important to say I think that at this at this particular moment, um, some of the best, strongest, most powerful, most fascinating poetry in America today is being written by poets of color. And this, this moment is, <laughs> there's this word incentivizing, terrible word. This, this moment, um, a, long, a long moment that's not only the last four years, but a long, long moment of American history has been leading up to this time in which, um, in part, thanks to Cave Canem, an organization that encourages and helps create poets of color, um, created by Toy Derricotte, who is here somewhere. Um, she is, there she is, I see her. There you are. <laughs> um, Thanks, thanks in part to Toy, and in part just to a, a concurrence of energies building and building and building until they have to explode in language and art. And if you if you want to see the dynamics of art that comes from a time and speaks to a time and is thrilling, um, that's where to look. Toy, do you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Um, Putting on the spot, sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, um, I'm in touch with uh, some of the writers from Kaveh Kanem who are paralyzed too. Um, I know for me as, as an African-American writer, um, I, I just came in, in touch with so much that we hadn't really pulled up the grief that was just so painful that you couldn't even look at it. You just had to, you know, keep on going, getting ahead. And uh, some of what's happening now, starting with George Floyd, of course, uh, just brought up stuff that was going on in my childhood that the adults didn't talk about. It, we just couldn't deal with it. It couldn't uh, accept that kind of sorrow. So I'm writing, I'm writing about, uh, you know, as Joyce was saying, you know, who are you writing for? Who are you writing about uh, now? what is your connection? And um, so my connection, uh, you know, I always had a kind of a shaky connection with that poetry that we said was the poetry that you were talking about, Alicia, whether that was the lyric poetry of the time uh, or the dramatic poetry of the time. As an African-American poet, I always had a complicated connection to that uh, that kind of poetry. And now I, I feel that my connection to uh, these things that are deeply uh, resonant with, the pa with our past that haven't been addressed in my, in my own consciousness and my own spirit, 
I'm, those are coming up for me. And also just personal experience day to day, good, good things that help me, uh, you know, balance myself. So I'm writing, but I'm not revising. That I don't have the energy to do, if that makes sense. Okay, let's, let's move on to Gina, Gina Thornburg. You, you have a question. Gina, are you still there? Did we lose you? Yeah, no, here I am. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let me go back. I had put it in the chat. Um, I think I was asking Alicia, please, what, it, what, how would you characterize the role of time and the passage of time in your poetry? Time and the passage of time. Ooh, what an interesting question. But I'm, go I'm going to turn it back to you in just a minute and ask what it is for you. But um, that's, such a, that's such an interesting question. And I think there's, there's a difference between writing in the in the in the present moment and writing from memory and i don't i don't have that many poems about memory um i think but i could be wrong because <laughs> i have very little memory and i forget what i've written once, once it's, but I do, I do have, I do have a recent, a recent poem in which I remember, because it was just my birthday, and my birthday is Armistice Day, uh, which when I was a child was a holiday celebrating the end of World War I and now is a holiday celebrating war. Celebrating veterans is celebrating war. Um, and I've got, I've got a poem about um, sitting on my father's shoulders in my, in my sailor suit, in my little itchy wool sailor suit, um, watching an Armistice Day parade and thinking about thinking about peace, um, and at the end of the poem, and it and it often happens if you don't know where a poem is going to go that it surprises you, and that poem ends by saying that memories are like ghosts. And we tend to be afraid of ghosts. And I think I'm afraid of many of what I could be, many of the memories I could be having. I don't want to have. Um, that's why I have a bad memory. But the, that particular memory is like a ghost that didn't come to strangle me, but came to bless me. And sometimes that happens too. Um, there's also, I've got, I've got a poem that's a kind of elegy for my father who died when I was 27 and came back and visited me 12 years later. In a dream? No, in a kind of waking dream. In the car. What did he I say? Uh, I was I was driving. I was driving from Venice, California, up up to uh, Arcadia, where we were living at the time. Seven late seventies, I think. Um, and it was it was late. It was after a poetry reading, and I was a little bit drunk or a little bit high, and driving around seventy up the freeway when um, I noticed that my father was floating along outside the car. And I thought, 
Yes. Oh, he's been there all the time and I haven't noticed. I guess that's what mourning is. Um, <laughs> and, and when I thought that something clicked and I knew that he was just always there. And then he was inside me um, as an ally and a friend. And I knew I wouldn't have to mourn him anymore. So that's something, that's something about time. I'll jump in with a question. So yeah. what about you, Tina? Come on. You know, I'm what sorry. Time? But What's time in your own work? The Port Lord of New York has put you on the spot, dear lady. Oh dear, oh my goodness. <laughs> well, right, right now I haven't been doing creative writing. I've been, I've been more in the activist realm. <laughs> here in LA, but I think what struck me about your work, this, this incredibly beautiful image, babies infinitely soft, and then the poem that was in the chat about April and just all of the images that um, come, have come alive for you and that snapshot of the season. And um, I think for me during the pandemic, time has become surreal, unreal, particularly with the constant stream of Zoom meetings, it seems to be difficult to hold on to when you talk to who, <laughs> to whom, yeah. which, which day and what time of and The bottom half is pajamas, half is your Zoom shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, I, I don't know, time, time right now during the pandemic, it's hard to discern whether it's flowing fast or it's a blur or where we are it's a very um, strange time it is that i think many many people are experiencing time as a blur and not knowing what day it is i'll, I'll jump in with a question and uh, is this um and this uh, will we'll give us one to jerry as well to take a crack at is there an intersection between poetry and science? Oh, I mean, it's, it's interesting in that, you know, you have two disparate careers, but at some point they overlap. I mean, they're and, and I'll even open that one up because I noticed uh, uh, Jill Tarter joined us from SETI and some other folks. And I'm just curious if, how, how you juxt, juxtapose when I stumble over that, it's early in the morning here in California, one with the other, or, or are they in fact complementary traits? Our complementary world. Mm -hmm. One of the heart, one of the mind, one of the. I could give a quick sure. answer. Go for it. <clears throat> um, it's not an accident that I married a poet. <laughs> um, the scientists are good at working things out and testing their ideas to see if they're correct. But where do the questions come from? how do you decide what's important to look at? What is it that's interesting? What is it that's unknown? Those are the questions that the poets ask. And the, the scientists read the poets, and the scientists listen to the poets. And so they, there's a tremendous influence of literature in general, and poetry in particular, on science. It's in defining the issues. That's the brief answer. The poets don't work out the details. That's left to people with computers. <laughs> well, I could I could add to that. I think that's a that's a correct answer, and a footnote to Jerry's answer is I think we we realized early on that though many people thought it was very strange and peculiar. Um, couple that we made, a scientist and a poet, uh, we realized that there was um, great overlap, that, that both of us were workaholics, that both of us um, thought we, we, we were in pursuit of realities that were not on the surface. And had and had to be um, discovered through digging, through work, um, 
and that both of us um, were obsessed with, uh, with getting it right, with revising and revising and revising what we had done until we thought, now it's right. And that's true for poets and for scientists. You know, I almost want to open this question up too to uh, both to, to Michael Werner and Seti's Jill Jill Tarter. Uh, I, yeah. I would just like to flip it around to say that the scientists question and it's the poets that offer evidence. <laughs> <laughs> we can be made there in arguments, but I'm just curious. And as we, you know, there there is a poetic element to science in terms of the, the process of discovery. And I just want to, uh, if uh, you know, put both Jill Tarter and Michael Warner on the on the spot a second. Jill, um, hi Bob, uh, is not is not in the bio, and is, and and uh, she is very she is uh, the probably the most well known person within the field of SETI, and we all we all mourn the loss of Arecibo today. And uh, and Michael, of course, was the uh, chief scientist on the Spitzer Sky uh, Space Telescope. So what are your thoughts there? Oh, Bob, um, being... Let me just say hello, Jill. Hi, Jerry. Hi, Mike. <laughs> so being, you know, being in a remote observing facility, because most of the time they aren't close to, to any civilization because you want to avoid light pollution and radio frequency interference. Being at such a site and having control of some very powerful instrument for uh, understanding the cosmos in, in new ways, um, and walking out and looking up at a dark sky. I mean, that's, it's so inspirational. It's, it's so much um, uh, an emotive experience uh, as well as an intellectual one. And I think the poetry has those same mixes of emotion and intellect. Michael, any comments before yeah, we well, I, I First of all, I agree with what both Jerry and Joel have said. In the case of the Spitzer Space Telescope, which studied the heavens for 16 years nonstop. Many of the things we discovered were absolutely amazing and beautiful and inspirational in their own way and created a sort of sense of awe and wonder in the same way that uh, poetry can. So I don't see any um, uh, contradiction or even conflict between uh, at least astrophysics and poetry. I think they, they're very nicely complementary and interlocked. Nice. And before we go on to the next question, both both Jill and Jerry have asteroids named after <laughs> each other, or themselves, I should say, not each other. Margo, you're up. Margo Alexander. You're on mute. Margo, you're on mute. I had mute. a question earlier that really reflected back on the city today. And um, it came up as another person said, that is kind of the city we miss. And I'm not, everyone says, oh, it'll come back. It always does. But some of what was always the draw to New York were jobs. And um, things have changed, the, the Zoom being one of them. And I, I, um, I feel a bit sad walking around it. The, the buildings are standing, but it looks like it's been bombed. So my question was, had you written anything during this period? And I think you said um, you had been a bit frozen. That's true, I have been frozen. Although I think it depends where you, where you live. Um, we were in we were in hard lockdown for close to three months, but then when we began going out again, we walk every day in Riverside Park, and it looks much the same as it always looked with people walking dogs and pushing strollers and kids on their scooters. So I have not experienced because I haven't gone to the places that have become wasteland. So I, my experience of my neighborhood has not actually changed that much. 
but I think it's what I know is going on out there beyond me that has frozen me. Stay in your neighborhood. Okay. <laughs> and and uh, any other comments from from some of the um, poets and writers on that? Because that's interesting. It's interesting because you look back to that when you're in the meat of the of the crisis, it, it there is there is a par there is a paralysis. But once you move out of it, all of a sudden these these points in time become inflection points for novels to begin. Be it 9/11 or you know the Kennedy assassination or prior to that, uh, you know some of the other historical events that we've had here in the United States. Um, it's important to say that um, in times of crisis, people do turn to poetry. And after 9-11, there was an immense geyser of poetry everywhere in the country, huge, huge quantities of poetry being, being written after 9-11. And somewhere I did have a quote about that, but no, I, don't. I had some I had some numbers about how how the the quantity of of poetry being being published in 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 small magazines you know multiplied by 10 after after 9 11. we'll move on to um heather Carrio. i think you have a question or is it a statement i'm not sure but heather you're up if you want the ball unmute my audio Oh, th oh, that's great way back to lyric poetry about the city uh, where and I was thinking that um, the lyric poetry of the city was written by the poets songwriters of the 1920s and 30s so things like I'll take Manhattan you know by Rogers and Hart and, and that's where I when I think of the lyric poetry about the city I think of literally those lyrics but that was way back in the conversation so <laughs> Okay, we'll go to uh, to Melly Shortoff for the question. You're on. You're on mute, dear. At this point, my question sounds a little flip. I wasn't familiar with Alicia, unfortunately, until today, so I can Google um, this. But I wondered if there's a living to be made as a poet laureate, or if you are just a, a professor on the side, or doing something else on the side. Just curious. <laughs> there is not a living to be made as a poet laureate. Damn. And most poets do not make their living from poetry. Occasionally, mm -hmm. there are poets who don't teach. Um, Allen Ginsberg was one. He made a living from poetry. Um, uh, and and a few other poets have been able to do so. Some of them are novelists, and you can make a living as a novelist. But not that I was going to try to replace you or anything. I was just <laughs> curious as to whether it's just an honorarium, if there's any money involved, or just awards and things to hang on your crowded walls. Oh, are we frozen? Oh, you 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 get a little money, and then and you spend a lot of it on the projects you want to do. Uh, but let, let's open that up for a second. But what I like to say is, what I like to say is that being um, New York State Poet Laureate um, and having um, having my my subway card, my metro card. We'll get me onto the subway. <laughs> <laughs> what would I mean? We'll open this question up to Andre and uh, to 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 Joyce, perhaps to to Alicia and everybody. What would the great beat poets have said about this time? 
I mean, okay. we talked about Allen Ginsberg. What would he have said had he been here, uh, maybe on this call, or maybe if, if he was able to transcend the, his, his mortal coil and publish now, how, how would he have commented? Now, well, let's he did. Go this for would have been a time. This would have been Allen's time, too, because he was the poet in the great crisis, and every crisis, and uh, he uh, was a political poet who was present in the protested war and uranium and uh, uh, leader of uh, the gay rights movement. And he was indeed a great poet, political moment, poet of the political moment. He was there and uh, he would have been there in the same way. Uh, he would have been a voice, you know, uh, in in this in the same way he wouldn't have written Howell, which he didn't do after he wrote Howell, but he would have been on uh, the air and on the radio and on television and on the streets uh, talking about uh, the crimes of the current uh, uh, tyranny in the making or would be tyranny and so on and he he would have liked this but I. What I wanted to as to tell, uh, I, mean, I have a very favorite line of Alicia's uh, here that um, uh, is, um, it is, it is true that looking for consciousness in the brain is like looking in the radio for the announcer, which is, <laughs> which is a wonderful line. And, uh, you know, it's one uh, that I was wondering if it, this is a metaphysics that runs through uh, through her through your poetry, and uh, uh, I was wondering about that particular line: is uh, where is the uh, station? Who? What is the voice uh, speaking there? And in that sense, it would be a question that Jerry might want to <laughs> answer as well. Well, first, I want to say something about Ginsburg, and that is that it. I wish we still had him with us because he was not not only a voice of 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 quote unquote protest he was a he was a a voice of hope and joy as as well as protest, um, I re I remember, and there's a, a little bit of this in the film we just watched, um, the Trial of the Chicago Seven, which I recommend to everyone. The new version of the Trial of the Chicago Seven. Um, Alan has a bit part in which, as as uh, a crowd is on its way to provoke or be provoked by police into a riot. Alan started chanting Om, and he got everybody to chant it and things calmed down and nobody got clubbed. Mm -hmm. um, it would be wonderful to have him now also because he is so funny. Mm -hmm. um, but, any other? Uh, what was your What was your question? Andre? Well, it's, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I saw, I saw where does it thing. Where does it come from? Where does it come from? Oh, um, it's uh, yeah. My my scientist husband and I agree that another thing we have in common is that we don't know where the ideas come from. Yeah, this is on page one sixty six of your volcano uh, book. Uh, it's it's a longer poem. It's uh, Q and A reality, actually. <laughs> Speaking of Q and A's, that's where the line comes from, and it does say, uh, "I'll read it again." I think it's I, yeah. somebody said that. I don't know who said it. It is. Oh, somebody said that. It is true that looking for consciousness in the brain is like looking for in the radio for the announcer. Uh, it's a great. Somebody line. else. Somebody else said that. <laughs> I just. I just stole it. Ah, and yes, the Chicago 7 thing is quite good. Uh, we, we actually had two members of Chicago 7 over the years. Tom Hayden joined us on several occasions. And a friend of ours, who's part of the Luncheon Society, actually has a cameo as John Mitchell's secretary. And 
Kathleen Garrett, I believe her name is. But, yes. Um, asking oneself, where do the ideas come from? Where do the words and the phrases and the and the whole pile that becomes a poem or any work of art come from? Um, I like I like to quote D. H. Lawrence, um, who has the great line, "Not I, not I, but the wind that blows through me." Not I, not I, but the wind that blows through me. Um, that's, that's very real to me because I have no clue where it comes from. And you can't make it come by wishing. Uh, Amory O'Connor, you're up. You're on mute, Jeff. You're on mute. There you go. There I go. Well, I think your urban poems are just gorgeous. Uh, but I read somewhere that you were uh, one of the first poets to write about motherhood. I guess from first person that would be. I was in California in the late 70s and I saw Ntozake Shange and Allen Ginsberg and Ferlinghetti read poetry and I read Denise Levertov and a lot of poetry. It was a very exciting time for poetry there at that time. And you would have also, you were also writing poetry there then. And uh, what was it like to be emerging as an American poet who was also female? Did you get a sense that you were breaking new ground? <laughs> I mean, when my mom had our bodies ourselves like on the table. So it was just a kind of an effervescent time. And I wonder what, what it was like. <laughs> Toy is laughing. <laughs> um, yeah, the the first poem that I wrote about pregnancy and childbirth was back in 1964, and I wrote it based on my first two pregnancies. Um, and as I was writing it, it it was a, a in a poem in what I later called Nine Parts and a Postpartum. Um, and at the time that I was writing it, I realized that I had never, I had never in 1964 read a poem about pregnancy, childbirth, motherhood. Um, such poems were just beginning to exist, but I hadn't read them. I hadn't read Sylvia Plath until a little later. Um, I realized that it wasn't simply that women were mostly excluded from poetry, and it wasn't simply that the few women who became known as poets were typically unmarried. It was that it was a taboo. Um, in the same way as um, in the 19th century, nobody would write a lyric poem about how exciting and interesting a, a city was. Nobody would write a poem in praise of London uh, because it was a taboo. And in much the same way, nobody before exactly that moment would write a poem from the point of view of a woman about her own body and what her body could and would do. It, you wouldn't talk about such things in mixed company. So obviously you couldn't write about them in work intended for the public. But the thing is that you don't know that there is a taboo. You don't know that a taboo exists until it's broken. You understand? So when I, 
when I found myself writing about pregnancy, I, re I, I realized that it was a taboo and that I was breaking it and that I liked breaking it and wanted to go on breaking taboos as much as I possibly could. There's a nice line in Virginia Woolf's um, Room of One's Own where she quotes her father saying, um, if you see a sign saying no trespassing, trespass immediately. And then in the 70s, I was writing about the birth of my son in 1970, a few days after we invaded Cambodia and shot the kids at, at Kent State. And I realized, as I had not realized before, though I had two daughters, that to have a son means, as Adrienne Rich said, a French woman once told her, Oh, you have a son? Oh, Madame, you travail pour l'armée. You're working for the army. That's what you have sons for, uh, to raise them and give them away to your country to go and kill and be killed. Um, and that was the foundation of a book called The Mother Child Papers. Um, but but right at that moment, um, many women were, were beginning to write about the physical experiences of living in a, in a woman's body. And now you can see shelves of books about pregnancy, motherhood, nursing. It's no longer taboo. And, and what's also good news is that um, men didn't used to write about fatherhood, and now they do. Okay, we'll move on to Catherine Bu I'm, I'm gonna, uh, Catherine Bunin, you're up. She might be on. No, no, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, I want to thank Alicia for inviting me. This has been really, really very interesting. I forgot what I wrote, but I think essentially it was, I wondered as writers, if you, since you couldn't follow your normal routines, that you found yourself developing new, new ways of writing, new, new themes, perhaps. That's the question. Okay, well, right now I'm not writing any poetry at all, and I'm, I've, been, I've been writing a lot of letters, um, writing, writing all, all, all my friends, and we write each other describing how it's going for us. Um, so I'm doing that, and I'm, and I'm also trying to write something that I call in the bardo. Um, the bardo is is what the what what the the individual experiences after dying and before being reborn into the next life. And uh, for for some people, the bardo means what happens to you when you have had a loss a big enough loss so that you no longer feel you have have ground to stand on and don't quite know who you are and um and you must and you must go through this period of not being the person you thought you were in the world that you thought you were living in. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to write about that. It's weird. I, I didn't, I, I can't get anything else on the chat page. So I just Let's wanted to forward. say one thing. Um, I, I would love to hear from everybody who does know Alicia's poetry what their favorite line is. I didn't know the line about the, about the con about consciousness and the announcer inside the radio, 
But my favorite line of Alicia is that I'm constantly using, if people come to me with a problem, I, I just quote it all the time and then talk about the mother-child papers and talk about what pregnancy teaches women and taught you. Um, and that is, and oh, to grow means pain. And it's from the mother-child papers. You know, that, that if you think about the male version of growth, it's, it's a very positive thing. It goes along with production and ambition and goals and getting there and all of those things. Um, but what Alicia says is, and oh, to grow means pain. Um, and pain, you know, labor is what we call the giving birth thing, which is not exactly pain for many, many people. It is more like labor. It's pushing and it's, um, and I, and I just, I just wanted to report to you that um, I have not often thought of poetry as a kind of therapy in the sense of a way to help other people. But that line is constantly uh, near the, <laughs> near what I utter because people are, you know, ha having trouble. And if you transform it into, well, but that you're growing, you're moving toward this, you, you know, as in, as in the growth of a pregnancy of a child ready to <laughs> manage to breathe and live. And um, so I wanted to tell you that and thank you that, thank you for that. You. Um, and I would love to hear what other people's favorite lines of Alicia, of Alicia are. Let's open it up a bit and let's see. Um, I, I will have to just go with Andre's comment. I'll, that'll be my new favorite. Barbara, what do you think? You're on mute. I love, I mean, you know that I, what so, poems that I love, but when you talk about babies in the strollers as lamps of light. Well, uh, the joy of the hope in that. Uh, I had a uh, comment. Uh, I didn't realize I was supposed to put my name in. Uh, no, you know, the, 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 and the nice thing about this, every group is different. And there is kind of a collegial quality about this. So I can open it up uh, and just kind of let it happen as it's kind of supposed to happen, which is kind of a cool thing. So go for it. God. Okay. So I don't know how to get on this screen uh, or if people hear me, I'm not muted anymore. Uh, what I wanted to say, it's sort of jumping backwards a bit, but there are two things. What I really love going back to the urban poems. This is Julie Chula. She, I, I'm there. Hi, Julie. Hi, hi, Alicia. Is as you know, I no longer live in New York City. And hearing you read those poems uh, made, you know, they capture all the variety and the excitement of New York and all the people and the energy and things that I miss so much about New York. Um, you know, I live in a place that calls itself a city, which is Sarasota, Florida, but it, to me, it's the furthest thing from the city. There's maybe one crossroads that feels slightly urban. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was the interaction between you and Jerry, the science and the poetry, because I've observed that. And it's fascinating to see how your thoughts go back and forth um, and I guess feed and inspire each other. So that's one thing I wanted to say. You know, I'm not a poet for those of you who are. Uh, I'm a family member, <laughs> and, uh, but I love Alicia's poems and uh, and just they, they, um, it is an inspiration as this discussion has been. So. I think, I think part of the 
consequence of living with a scientist and someone who is truly rational is that rationality is not is not um, necessarily walking in a straight line. One of the things that rationality, that the, ha the habit of rationality will do for you or to you is open you to surprise. And that, and surprise is a wonderful thing to experience in poetry and, and to remind you that life is full of surprises that, um, that you were not expecting and that you should treasure. Bob? Uh, what's interesting is I do see a, uh, a commonality between poetry and acting. I'll put Melanie on the, on, the, on the spot for a second, gently, of course is that you really do put yourself out there. There's almost a quality of improv about it because you have to, you have to see where the poet takes you or the, where, where the potential of the poem takes you. In the same way you, as an actress or actor, you need to see, you need to explore where the scene takes you beyond the construct of the script. And the relationship too. Um, you know, we, we deal in unpacking the subliminal. It's what's between the words that's important. Uh, the words are beautiful in many cases in good poetry, certainly in Shakespeare, <laughs> but it's what we embody it with as actors uh, and readers that gives it the magic, you know, the extra lift and heft. I hope. Okay, let's see. What well, we silence, is, silence is important also. Yes. The pause is, is as important as the note. Wow. So who else has a question here? I, hi. Tim, and, and, it, and it's your birthday today, dear. So I, I want to just say, Alicia, that um, it's my birthday. And what do you do during your birthday these days? You know, nothing. But when I heard about this, this is my gift, was to be able to hear you read and listen to this conversation that's just been truly better than any birthday party I could think of right now. Um, so, and I grew up on the Upper West Side of New York, 89th Street, Riverside Drive was my park. And I lived in LA for 40 years, but I'm still writing poetry about Riverside Drive and Central Park and the fruit stand. And I think those things are so, you know, they're just so ingrained that there's no separation. I mean, LA, there's a lot to write about, but New York is stuck inside me. And when I hear your poems, uh, it just brings everything to life. And I'm still, I spoke to my piano teacher today who turned 90 yesterday. Uh, and she and I, every time I go to New York, we walk to the only statue of a woman in New York City, which is Eleanor Roosevelt on 72nd Street. Yep. That incredible. And um, we call it Visiting Eleanor. And the two of us walk, walk to see her. But um, I just want to thank you for doing this. This is great. And the whole idea of time also, I just want to say that for me personally, this blur and not knowing what day it is, or even sometimes what hour, uh, is helpful in, in writing poetry for me, because it's all about, um, it's all about getting it better and better and better, and you don't have to look at a clock or worry about, you know, where the time is going, because there is no time, in a way. <laughs> so revision becomes just this endless blur and just about the discovery part of science and poetry, which I loved listening to all of that. But, you know, for those of us who write poetry, the only reason we write it, I think, in part, um, is to discover what the poem is about. And oftentimes we don't know what the poem is about till we get to that last line. So it is a, a science project every time we sit down uh, <laughs> to write. So... Anyway, thank you for, for my birthday. That is, 
I will remember that. Every poem is a science project because you don't know. You, you don't know what you'll find. You don't, you don't know what you'll find. It's sort of, yeah, it's sort of like penicillin. You know, they didn't <laughs> discover penicillin until it was on Dr. Flory's lab coat. And then, and the woman who had an infection, I just read this, uh, was infected by a thorn of a rose bush. And it just accidentally dropped in whatever they were giving her. And it was the antibiotic. But so we think we're going to write a poem about one thing and suddenly we discover what the poem is about. So that, that, that does happen all the time. Thank you for pointing that out, Kim. Um, but I want to say also, I know that statue, I know that sculpture of Eleanor and my, my most recent book, The Volcano and After, um, near the end, there is a suite of poems about Eleanor Roosevelt. Great. I will. Um, okay, so we're right about Alma. We have a few minutes left before we sign off for the rest of the year. Can I ask her one uh, rhetorical you question? Most certainly can, Heather. Alicia, I'm just wondering if you're writing letters. I mean, far be it for me, but if you're writing letters, if those letters could be turned into epistolatory poems to lead you back to poetry writing. Could be. I, yeah, I'm writing, I'm writing letters um, full, of, full of fetches and also saying how beautiful the trees in Riverside Park are and how I have become completely convinced that they are sentient. Wow. So that ends the 2020 Lunch and Society season. We'll be back next year. What we do is we take the holidays off simply just out of tradition because good luck trying to get a restaurant, a private room during the, you know, between Thanksgiving and New Year. That ain't gonna happen. But now that we've moved to a different astral plane here, there could be all sorts of possibilities. And we're already working on, a, I'm already working on a number of fun stuff for next year. It'll be film, it'll be politics, it'll be science, it'll be all sorts of stuff. And I, I've looked here, I see, <clears throat> I see Heather here. And uh, one thing we did uh, a while back that I want to do again is we, we, we brought, I, I have a love for character actors and her husband is a very good one. And, um, we had, you know, Stephen Tobolowsky and some other people about just being, and I see Melanie's head going up and down. He's just, he's just an amazing guy. Not only is he a great storyteller, a great actor, and you, you wouldn't know these guys unless you saw them and you said, aha, there they are. There's all sorts of science stuff we're working on, politics, film. Film is, is the reason why we went to, to Los Angeles in the first place. And I still think of the, um, there was just a great, one of the great story before we take off. And we had, this was 48 hours after, I think, the 2006 Academy Awards, and we, were, we had a, uh, a luncheon, uh, actually a dinner with Roger Ebert. And it was great because there's a place in um, Santa Monica called Michael's. It's basically staffed by, staffed by actors, actresses, people in the film. So what well, was supposed to be a seven to nine, and, and I'm sure Kim, Kim's familiar with the place, uh, was supposed to be like a seven to nine dinner, turned into a seven to 2.30 in the morning dinner. And it was, you know, and, and it was wonderful because he kept saying, uh, we're off the record here, right? Or, and he told just story after story. And what was astonishing about it is that the actors and actresses went home, quickly got their screenplays and headshots and were slipping them under the tables. It was like, a, it was like, a, it was like this, this Hollywood scene that you're in the middle of. And that's, and again, so all the, just the crazy stuff that we do here. I wanna thank you all for coming. We'll hang around afterwards. And Alicia, thank you so much for just a mind blowing gathering. Thank you. Okay. okay. Well, thank you very much. I'll hang around after this and I'll let you all get back to your day. <laughs>